Hi, everyone. Welcome to this webinar called Migrations, Dissecting Discrimination, the Living Legacy of Migration, Race, and Politics. I'm Stevie Allaire, and I'll be the moderator for this webinar. A few administrative matters here. This webinar is being recorded, and the recording will go out shortly after the webinar. If you have any questions during this hour-long webinar, feel free to post them in the chat, and we'll get to as many as we can. I am Stevie Allaire, and I'm Professor of Immigration Law Practice at Cornell Law School and a faculty fellow at the Cornell Migrations Initiative. Um, I'm going to help moderate the panel. And first, we're going to have a few introductory words from Mike Kotlikoff, the provost at Cornell University. After that, I'll talk a little bit about the Migrations Initiative generally. And then I'll turn it over to Wendy Walford, who is vice provost for international affairs and also the Ruth and Robert Paulson, Department of Global Development Professor in Cornell's College of Agricultural and Life Sciences. After that, Gerard Oching, Professor of Africana and Romance Studies, and a member of the Migrations Initiative Task Force will speak. And then Shannon Gleason will speak. She is Professor and Chair of the Department of Labor Relations, Law and History at Cornell's School of Industrial and Labor Relations. If you do have any questions, Feel free to post them. We'll get to them when we can. So let's get started. And Mike, why don't you take it off and give us a few introductory words. Thanks, Steve. And hi, everyone. It's a great pleasure to welcome you and introduce this eCornell keynote on dissecting discrimination. Part of Cornell's migrations initiative and supported by a generous grant from the Mellon Foundation. As we continue to confront the great coronavirus pandemic and try to contemplate a post-pandemic world, we quickly think of the impact of the movement of people, animals, plants, and other organisms on public health. But I'm afraid we are looking at only the tip of the iceberg. When SARS-CoV-2 is a distant memory or a mild irritation, we will continue to confront the difficult historical factors underlying hunger, political instability, and violence, all of which propel mass migrations. Today's speakers and the Cornell Migrations Initiative explore these important topics. Migrations are accelerated, and their complex geopolitical and economic underpinnings have deep roots in colonialism, resource exploitation, and racism. This webinar will explore these factors, their historical basis, current discriminatory immigration policies, and future trends. Our panelists will examine the political stresses produced by migration and address ways to respond to this extraordinary challenge. Thank you for your interest in a subject that will continue to challenge our humanity and our ability to respond to human suffering. Thanks, Mike, for that. Um, and now I'm going to give a few words about how we chose migration as our first grand challenge. It started about a year and a half ago when Cornell decided it wanted to address some grand challenges facing the world. People from across Cornell met for one and a half days to discuss possible grand challenge topics. And in the end, we chose migrations as our first grand challenge. We believe that migration is one of the most important and challenging issues of our time. And we think that understanding the issues requires new ways of doing research, teaching, and engagement. We also believe that we need to study migration, not just of people, but also plants, animals, and microbes. The Cornell Migrations Initiative is truly multi-species, cross-disciplinary and international in scope. scope. Ascari, next slide, please. Here's a screenshot of our migrations website, which is at migrations.cornell.edu. Just to set the context, last year, approximately 300 million people migrated across international borders. Many more than that migrated within a given nation, particularly from rural to urban areas and from coastal areas to inland. But it wasn't just humans migrating, animals and plants and microbes too. As our planet warms and our population grows, along with rising inequality and geopolitical tensions, 
all of these migrations are increasing and influencing each other and influencing the communities they move to and from. Humanists call this the quickening. Charles Blow identified all these migrations in an op-ed in the New York Times recently. He argued that taken together, these different migrations are reshaping the world. You or I may not physically move, but the food we eat, the people we know, the viruses we contract, migration affects all of this. As the world moves in new ways, we need to adapt as well. Here at Cornell, we have world-leading scholars of migration in every college, both in Ithaca and New York City. But these students and faculty have often worked in ways that are relatively decentralized and diffuse. People who work on human migration tend to be separate from people who work on animal migration or plants or microbes. In the humanities, people who work on race and migration do tend to do so separately, even though we know how closely related these issues are. So we need to think outside of boxes and instead in terms of resilience, flexibility, adaptation, mixture, diversity, and movement. After choosing migrations as Cornell's first grand challenge, we convened a task force to help figure out what to focus on in this broad topic. You see the slide there, you see the wide diversity of subject matters and departments involved in the migrations task force. The Migrations Initiative provides a space for faculty and students who focus on migrations to work together. When we started the initiative, we had initial funds from the provost and generous support of certain alums. With that, we supported multidisciplinary research teams, new undergraduate courses, a regular lab meeting that serves as a think tank for new ideas and collaborations, a movie series, a podcast series, a summer institute, and a seminar series featuring Cornell faculty that brought in over 1,000 unique participants. Here's a short video about the Migrations Initiative. So the Migrations Grand Challenge at Cornell is inspired by this big idea that our environment, our economic structure, our social world are all related to how humans, plants, animals, ideas migrate. to think about crisis across regions. Medicine, law, and technology. Films, written work, and visual art. Agriculture, human trafficking. The migration of protected species in the oceans. And so these migrations almost set the heartbeat of the, of the natural world. 65 authors, scholars from all over the world. The Migrations Global Challenges allows me to sort of broaden the interdisciplinarity, multidisciplinarity of the work that we're doing. Real-time learning as public health professionals, taking advantage of this real living laboratory. What we want to understand is how do think these species such as bowhead whales, which have a lifespan of two to 300 years, how are they changing their migration uh, patterns as a function of global climate change? So Indonesia is among the first nations to initiate a climate-based migration, transitioning its rapidly sinking, flood-prone capital city from Jakarta to Borneo. The Underground Railroad, which as its name already suggests, was a form of clandestine migration. Basically, my students and I study the Underground Railroad as a form of civil disobedience to provide refugees and asylum seekers knowledge about their legal rights in order to advance their access to healthcare. And how migrants bear witness to their experiences. We have people working from the law school, the medical school, the social sciences, and Cornell Tech. Without the Grand Challenge, each of us would have been in our own scientific silos. But by working together, we can get new insights into public benefits and how immigrants are using or not using public benefits. Urge us to decenter the nation state as the only and maybe even the primal actor in shaping immigrant lives. We're trying to rewrite the history together of planetary movement over the past 500 years. All of the people here are studying particular movements, but doing so in ways that draw on different disciplines and perspectives, using migrations as a window onto understanding the broader processes at work. It's awesome to get to be a part of this initiative and to see how this collaborative approach can tackle existing problems, influence policy, and provide future leadership and scholarship on important migration issues. This is what we're calling our Global Grand Challenge, but ultimately the challenge is to make the world a better place.
In January of this year, the Cornell Migrations Grand Challenge won a three-year, $5 million grant from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation's Just Futures initiative that is bringing together scholars across the university and beyond to study the links between racism, dispossession, and migration. Research, teaching, and community engagement supported by the grant is responding to historical and ongoing nativist and racialized violence in the United States by turning Cornell into a living laboratory. The Mellon Foundation is one part of Cornell's overall migrations initiative, and we've been hard at work carrying out our Mellon Foundation grant. With that, now I'll turn it over to Wendy Walford, who will talk about Cornell's land acknowledgement and her recent research. Wendy? Steve, thank you so much. Thank you for the uh, great introduction to the migrations initiative, and hello to everyone who's here today. Thank you so much for coming. I want to start my talk, as Steve said, with Cornell University's formal land acknowledgement. Cornell is located on the traditional homelands of the Gayakono, or the Cayuga Nation. The Cayuga Nation precedes the establishment of Cornell University, New York State, and the United States of America. I acknowledge that Cornell benefited from the dispossession and alienation of these lands, and I recognize the ongoing connection of Gayakono people, past and present, to these lands and waters. This history of dispossession is relevant to what I want to talk about today. For the last 25 years or so, um, I've done research in a number of different countries around the world. And in 10 minutes, I don't have time to go very much into that empirical research, but I want to draw on it today to make one simple argument. I argue that plantation agriculture something that we don't talk about very often, at least in this country, in the United States. I argue that plantation agriculture is the source of many of the problems that we have in the world today, including dispossession, forced migration, and racism. In the United States, people tend to think of plantations as something that disappeared after the Civil War. But Southern tobacco and cotton estates represented only this particular historical moment in plantation agriculture. Plantations can be defined more broadly as large scale farming enterprises that produce a single crop or product and usually for export. They've historically been dependent on enslaved labor, but plantation agriculture has adapted and taken on wage laborers and industrial techniques. Around the world, partly a legacy of that earlier moment, farm laborers are some of the most marginalized and unprotected workers, often migrating from harvest to harvest. I'm on this slide right here because agricultural estates like the plantations I'm talking about have existed for hundreds of years. Ascari, back one slide, please. Um, but they became a truly global phenomenon in the context of feudalism in Europe in the 1500s. This is a painting by Oscar Pereira da Silva that dramatizes the arrival of the Portuguese on the shores of the land that would become known as Brazil. Next slide. By 1530, the Portuguese had set up the first sugarcane plantations in the New World. Sugarcane was a product that came to dominate not just Brazil, but many colonies and now countries in the region. And I can honestly say that no single crop has brought with it more poverty, dispossession, and violence than sugarcane. Next slide. Led by the Spanish and Portuguese, European nations in the 16, 17, 18, and 1900s introduced plantations into tropical countries around the world. These plantations were intended as a means of colonizing, settling, and developing the territories but they also required that local populations be moved off the land and then compelled to work on or for the plantations. Jared Diamond has an article, you might be familiar with Jared Diamond's work. He has an article in which he argues that agriculture was, quote, the worst mistake in the history of the human race. He says this because turning to cultivation as opposed to hunting and gathering, led to the production of a surplus that then allowed societies to develop hierarchies in which one class produced while other classes ruled. I would say I'm not as radical as Jared Diamond because I think agriculture was a boon to humans 
and I think that surpluses are a good thing, but agriculture was weaponized, if you will, under colonial rule, and colonial plantations created many of the divisions that endure today, divisions between developed and developing countries, or colonizing countries in their former colonies, or what we talk about often as first and third world. It's a bit of a misnomer. Between those who have property and those without, between white and non-white, usually landowners versus the workers, and between rural and urban. The establishment and protection of large-scale plantation agriculture justified slavery and other forced labor regimes as well as massive migrations and resettlements, or what in Africa they call villagization. All told, across the globe, the demand for tropical plantations led to highly discriminatory laws regarding labor, citizenship, taxation, and the right to hold property. Today, plantations still control a significant portion of the world's arable land. And you have to think about what the definition of a plantation is. I talked a little bit about this in the beginning. We have this picture of plantations as belonging to a particular time period. But plantations can be defined as large-scale, monocrop, export-oriented um, enterprises that um, usually require uh, wage labor of some kind. There isn't data available for the whole world on farm size or type. But at Conservate, it's very difficult to get that data. But um, looking across many different publications, a conservative estimate suggests that only 1% of farms in the world are over 200 hectares. Ascari, this slide, next slide, please. Only 1% of farms in the world are over 200 hectares, but they control at least 50% of the arable land on the planet. Those numbers actually understate the reach of plantations because roughly 15 to 20 percent of smallholder farmers worldwide are tied to plantations through contracts. This figure varies widely by country and crop, but contracts are a way to bring smaller growers into large-scale operations. On the face of it, the productive capacity of this agricultural system is mind-blowing. Colonial plantations from the 1500s to the mid-1900s fed and fueled two industrial revolutions, the first and second industrial revolution, and we have more than enough food today to feed 8 billion people. And yet, the United Nations considers our global food system to be broken, because at the end of the day, one-third of all food produced is lost or wasted, Almost one billion people go hungry, and another billion are considered to be poorly nourished. Beyond the question of simple supply and demand, how do people get access to the food that's produced, there are other legacies and characteristics of plantations that are important to consider, particularly for our conversation today. I'm going to touch very briefly on racism, inequality, ecological degradation, and mostly because of the times we're living in, disease. Plantations did not create these problems, but they thrived on them in a way and perpetuated them. So to begin with structures of race and racism, this one is actually probably the most obvious, but you rarely hear people talk about plantations when they're discussing race problems in any country. But plantations across the globe were like the original sin, they required dispossession, whether dispossession to take control of land or dispossession to take control of labor. This dependence on forced labor became baked into planter mindsets. And because political control in so many places originated in control over land, the enslaver mentality influenced the formation of political institutions, of markets, and of society. In Brazil, which is a country that I've worked in for a long time, since 1993, planters were so dependent on enslaved labor that even after slavery was abolished in 1888, the last country in the Western Hemisphere to do so, they treated free laborers so badly that other countries banned or discouraged their rural poor from emigrating to the country. In the United States, southern plantations erupted in violence and civil war, 
one outcome of which was the greatest internal migration in our country's history. Contemporary structures and acts of racism, such as dehumanized police treatment, ingrained or structural poverty, incarceration, redlining, ETJs, extra um, territorial jurisdictions, and so on, can be seen not as inevitable, but as inherent in a system shaped by the forced labor and the histories of the plantation. The second legacy of the plantation, I would say, is ongoing inequality. There's a lot to say here, and I don't have enough time to go into it. So I'll just say that after World War II, um, colonization was replaced, for the most part, with what Harry Truman called in 1949 development. And at that time, theories of modernization, progress and growth for new former colonies, they were still predicated on the power of the plantation. But now the profits from those plantations were supposed to benefit independent post-colonial nations. Plantation agriculture still required dispossession in order to produce available land and laborers, but now this plantation work would belong to the country. One of the countries I've worked in for a long time is Mozambique in Southern Africa. And I've been struck over and over again by that country's desire for large scale, highly modernized export agriculture, even though 80% of the country, 80% of the population lives in the countryside. And about 60% of that population lives below the line of absolute poverty. The average farm size in the country is under two hectares and only 5% of farmers have ever worked with a tractor. But plantations are seductive. They've been the holy grail in Mozambique since the Portuguese set up colonial rule, and this was back in 1885, and they continue to be so today. The slide here that you can see, sorry, Ascari, one back. The slide here that you can see is for a program, a very ambitious program across the country to bring plantation agriculture from Brazil over to Mozambique. It's largely not been a success, and I can go into that if people want. Um, but the ideal, the hope for plantation agriculture is very strong, even when most of the country would not be able to engage. The third legacy of the plantation, I won't go into very much just because it's not as relevant to our discussion today, but it is the degradation of ecological health. Large-scale agriculture is input and energy intensive, and it has these long supply networks that are not only energy dependent, but also highly vulnerable to disruption. We've seen that during COVID. Today, these vertically integrated agricultural chains are estimated to be responsible for sorry, agricultural and livestock chains, are estimated to be responsible for at least one quarter of all greenhouse gas emissions. A climate-friendly diet would likely be significantly higher in local fruits and grains and vegetables and dramatically lower in meat and processed foods than this sort of modern plantation diet. Fourth and finally, um, ecological degradation is linked to a disease and human health issues. Our global food system, as I've said, is incredibly productive. The emphasis though on staple grains and processed foods, um, what Prabhu Bengali in our Dyson school has referred to as this obsession with staple grains, this has had important health implications. So yes, we have food available, but we also have a rise in non-communicable diseases. And today, the most obvious problem is the rise in zoonotic viruses. Scientists have documented the relationship between deforestation, plantation production, and disease for a long time. In Ireland in the 1800s, the transition from smallholder production to large-scale monocrop estates very famously set off what we call the Irish potato famine. Although for a long time, we believed that the famine was due to the bad habits of the working poor. Today, there's um, increasing work, new work, on viruses from Ebola to COVID-19. And this work suggests that the emergence of these viruses transmitted from animals to humans is linked to deforestation and agricultural intensification 
which releases the virus from previously enclosed forested areas into more densely populated ones. So there's a lot more going on with COVID than simply deforestation or simply agricultural intensification, but this is one important driver. So here um, to end, you can um, imagine that there are many alternatives and sustained resistance to plantation agriculture. On those same shores that we saw in the beginning where the Portuguese landed 500 years ago, this incredible inequality in land ownership gave rise to one of the largest social movements in Latin American history. Members of the Brazilian landless movement, which is known as the MST for the Portuguese um, uh, acronym, they occupy unproductive farmland and petition the government for the right to produce on that land. The movement was founded in 1985 and has grown over to 1.5 million households. MST members, um, it's not a perfect movement, but they've replaced plantations with small farms, producing local, often organic food, and organizing markets, schools, and medical clinics that attempt to sort of undo some of the worst legacies of plantation extraction in Brazil. We shouldn't romanticize the efforts of MST members and local agriculture is not the solution to all of our problems, but as we grapple with climate change, pandemics, inequality, mass migration, and structural racism, my argument is that we should understand and potentially address the role that plantations have played in creating these problems. Thank you. Thanks, Wendy. Next, we'll have Gerard Aching tell us about his fascinating research on the Underground Railroad. Gerard? Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Wendy. And greetings to everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, the Underground Railroad Research Project is a collaboration between Cornell faculty and students and the St. James AME Zion Church in Ithaca, New York. I'd like to tell you a little bit about the Migrations Grand Challenge as it uh, has informed and invigorated our Underground Railroad Research Project. Seconding and substantiating Wendy's identification of the plantation as, a cru as crucial for examining the impact of humans on the globe we can view the 19th century emergence of the Underground Railroad as a courageous response to the systematic dehumanization of enslaved Africans and African Americans. It's important to note that beginning in the late 16th and early 17th centuries, and as Wendy has shown, plantations throughout the Americas were the sites where race, racism, and anti-Indian and anti-Black racialization first emerged as concepts and practices that justify slavery in the Western Hemisphere. Several of our colleagues in the Migrations Grand Challenge examine the migrations of species. Thanks to exposure to their work, I began paying closer attention to the pseudoscience of polygenesis, that is, the false theory that not all humans belong to the same species. This was a theory that emerged in the 1830s as a new way to rationalize racist processes of dehumanization. One of the foremost theorists of polygenesis was the Swiss American scientist, Louis Agassiz, who occasionally lectured at Cornell while he was also um, uh, teaching at Harvard. And there's a plaque uh, dedicated to him in our SAGE Chapel. He was one of the foremost um, uh, promoters of the idea of polygenesis in connection with uh, debates uh, with uh, Charles Darwin. The Underground Railroad, especially between 1830 and 1860, became one of the significant ways of physically rejecting slavery and leaving the plantation behind. This National Geographic map gives us a sense of the routes that freedom seekers took following the North Star to freedom in regions such as ours around Ithaca, as well as in other areas of central New York and western New York, and then all the way up to Canada. What this map doesn't show is that there were also routes to Mexico and down to the Caribbean through Florida. Uh, but uh, most of us know about uh, the uh, 
underground railroad having people go to the north, mostly on the eastern seaboard, as well as the Midwest. Now, the historian Eric Foner estimates that between 1,000 to 5,000 freedom seekers took to the Underground Railroad between 1830 and 1860. Now, you can imagine this is a guesstimate, you know, between 1,000 and 5,000. That's quite a discrepancy, but it's very difficult to get this information since the activity was clandestine. In addition to the economic blow, these numbers contradicted the slaveholders' purportedly paternalist claim that slavery was beneficial for the enslaved, that slaves were better off on the plantation rather than in Africa. Vigilance committees that included free African Americans, the congregations of black churches, black and white abolitionists, Quakers, and other anti-slavery adherents were crucial for running the Underground Railroad. And key figures in the clandestine railroad, such as Harriet Tubman, often passed through Ithaca, Auburn, and other parts of central and western New York. Tubman was responsible for directly assisting 70 to 75 freedom seekers and in 13 missions. And another uh, and scores of other freedom seekers uh, who uh, followed her uh, instructions and assistance through the Underground Railroad um, in the regions that she knew. Frederick Douglass was one of the most famous and influential African Americans um, at the time. He was active on the Underground Railroad in Rochester, occasionally came through Ithaca, and spoke at Ithaca's St. James AME Zion Church in 1852. The fundamental purpose of our Underground Railroad Research Project is to assist St. James in telling its story. Both Tubman and Douglas gravitated to Ithaca's principal Underground Railroad station, which was the St. James AME Zion Church, um, uh, which was built in 1833, 1833 to 1836, um, and is currently, I just found out very recently, that it is the oldest still active AME Zion Church in the world. Now, facilitating and traveling on the Underground Railroad was where clandestine activities that amounted to punishable civil disobedience, according to the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850. So, the primary question that our campus and community project has set out to answer is, how can we discover know and document the experience of being a traveler on the Underground Railroad or of assisting freedom seekers on their journey north. Very few documents tell us about these specific experiences. Two sub-projects attempting to answer this question have really taken off over the last year. With the enthusiastic approval of the St. James AME Zion Church, their congregation and church leadership, Professor Larry Brown from Cornell's Physics Department and Professors Adam Smith and Laurie Kachadurian from Cornell's Institute of Archaeology and Material Studies will be undertaking an excavation at St. James AME Zion beginning on Saturday, September 18th for nine consecutive Saturdays. There will be 12 student excavation teams, half of whom are Cornell students and the other half students from the Ithaca community in the 12 to 17 age range. The second sub-project, which entails the building of a website, has taken off thanks to the efforts of first-year students from the Milstein Program in Technology and Humanity under the tutelage of its director, Professor Austin Bunn, and its program manager, Meyer Anderson. Let's have a look at the website. The Voices on the Underground Railroad website is one of the projects that's come out of the Underground Railroad Research Project. And the whole purpose of this is to bring together the fictional narratives of students from my Underground Railroad seminar and other students from the Milstein Program in Technology and Humanity who have assisted us in pulling together this website.
the whole purpose of the website is to give a sense or have the students have a sense of what it might have been like to go through the Underground Railroad. So um, they read the classic slave narratives, they read histories of the Underground Railroad before they even put pen to paper and write these stories. And once these stories are on um, the map, we put them, we place them, uh, for example, with particular sites on this map, um, and we have a list of these sites here. And for example, if we go to one of these houses, you will get a sense of what it looks like today. But then you're also going to have the chance to listen to the story that the student uh, has written. Um, and the transcript is also there. Most of these stories uh, were begun based on a rumor of underground railroad activity. Um, that was written by Walter Gable, um, who is the county historian for Seneca County. So these are the components, basically. My students write these fictional narratives. The um, students from the Milstein program have worked to put this on a map as well as on this site. And together, the whole exercise is meant to have students go through like a sort of um, empathetic exercise in which they can try and understand what it might have been like to be on the Underground Railroad. The website is not currently public and we're working very hard to make that happen uh, next month and perhaps towards the end of next month. But in my final, the final words I'd just like to say is that the Migrations Challenge has afforded me obviously the possibility of making my research more visible and its resources um, uh, and this continued visibility are helping me in uh, to think about the sustainability of my project, which is not only mine, it's very collaborative now. So that uh, that's one of the things that I wanted to highlight in terms of the connection between the momentum that we've gotten from having of working with uh, the Grand Challenge in our Underground Railroad Research Project. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gerard. And next, Shannon Gleason will discuss her research on racialized migration, the carceral state, and worker precarity. Shannon? Thanks so much uh, to everyone who's here. Um, I'd like to introduce myself, Shannon Gleason. As Steve mentioned, I'm a sociologist working in a variety of interdisciplinary spaces here on campus, and I'm very pleased to co-direct the migration initiatives along with my colleague, Eric Tagliacozzo. And so what I'd like to do in my short time with you today is to thread together a few of the um, aspects of my research that I think tie into some of the conversations that we've begun here today. And to start with um, the title of a new book, for example, from Roxanne Dunbar-Ortiz, who, who's a historian, titled We Are Not All Immigrants. And I want to just kind of shift the conversation around from thinking about the United States, United States as simply a history of immigrants to also considering how the fight for immigrant rights here in this country is tied to the struggles for global justice, as Wendy ruled out, laid out, and as um, Gerard also discussed in his discussion of the Underground Railroad. And so I think it's important to connect this through line between struggles for slave abolition and, and struggles against native dispossession to what we find ourselves in right now in the United States. And part of what the initiative is attempting to do is to connect our global understanding of migration, uh, human migration and other eyes to local realities here in the United States and the many other places that immigrant communities here are connected to and think in my time here today specifically about the role of local institutions like Cornell. Next slide. And I want to start with what I always like to show my students, which is a historical overview of migration to the United States. And I think oftentimes when we hear the din of uh, media coverage around migration, we often think of the blue line, which is represented here, which is the number of migra migrants here in the United States, which tracks the population growth across the board in the United States and elsewhere. But what we often ignore is the orange line, which is the proportion of um, individuals in this country who are foreign born. And what's important to distinguish here is that while it is the case that 
Um, the number of migrants have increased, especially since um, important policies that were passed in 1965 with the, with the um, opening of um, migration to places in Latin America and Asia. What we miss is that the proportion of migrants and the role that migration plays today is not dissimilar to what we saw at the turn of the 19th and 20th centuries. But what has changed is who is migrating overwhelmingly in increasingly individuals from Latin America and Asia and how they're migrating. I often like to refer to my own biography and the circumstances under which my great grandfather migrated on one side of my family from what is now Kiev to the experiences that my mom had coming um, from Mexico. Very similar um, aspirations and um, desires and dreams, but very different political contexts. And so it's important for us as social scientists to think about how those um, contexts have changed. Next slide. And to do that, I often point individuals to the complicated relationship that the United States and really any nation state has to migration. And just to think specifically about the case of immigrant workers, you have really two arms of the state focusing on what is often most discussed, which is the case of undocumented migrants, which constitute roughly about 5% of the civilian labor force and much more than that in certain immigrant heavy destinations and industries. And what we see is that on the one hand, the US government is engaged in a form of racialization through its efforts to detain and deport migrants. Um, one of the interesting studies by Pirat Hagnadnu Sotelo and Tanya Golash Boza reveals that there are some very clear forms of racialization occurring, whereas about three quarters of uh, those who are detained and are or subject to deportation are Latino. Over about 98% of those who are ultimately detained and deported are Latino men. So there are racialization effects as well as gendered effects. And it's also important to know that those effects of deportation and detention through various arms of the state have spillover effects, especially in the arena of work, which I'll talk about in a moment. But alongside these forms of detention and deportation, we also have an arm of the state, which is dedicated to attempting to incorporate migrants into the realities of labor standards enforcement and other forms of workplace compliance. So I encourage us to think more in complicated ways about the role of the state. Next slide. Um, and one thing that we often do is to fixate on the current moment in which we are living in and the current moment which we left under the Trump administration. And we tend to focus on what was often referred to as these large scale raids. Um, but in fact, immigration enforcement has been a bipartisan effort of racialization of illegality. And the last administration certainly combined strategies from both Republican and Democratic um, administrations in the past. These silent raids or employer audits often occurring through the work site and through mechanisms tied to, for example, the IRS and Social Security Administration were enormously effective and some would say arguably much more effective than what we've seen under Republican administrations. And so this too is an important form of racialization as the vast majority of individuals who are targeted and caught up in these raids are workers of colors. Uh, next slide. And what's important also to highlight is that these workers who are subject to these conflicting arms of immigration enforcement, as well as attempts to hold employers accountable to workplace exploitation are not just undocumented immigrants, but also increasingly temporary migrants or many different forms of migrants who may fall in and out of status. The last major um, amnesty or legalization program that we had was in 1986. And so many immigrants are subject to this uncertainty. And what I also like to point people to, it is not just the role of the federal government, although immigration is, as Steve has written about in much of his work, um, the purview of the federal government. It's impossible to think about the racialized effects of immigration policy without also considering the role of states like the state of New York, Arizona, California, and local policy like here in Tompkins County and the city of Ithaca. And so when we think about the critique that one may have of the way that states operate vis-a-vis -vis immigrants, it's not just federal regulation, but also what we like to refer to as sub-federal re regulation. And this is imp increasingly important as migrants move to newer destinations uh, as a secondary form of migration. Maybe they may start in, say, the San Francisco Bay Area and then end up in oftentimes less incorporative contexts like the Central Valley. And so that's a lot of the research that social scientists are also doing to think about not only the different 
context that migrants are subject to and the relationship that that plays to broader communities, but also the conflicting policies that often happen, the experiences of migrants in the downstate area of New York are not the same as what we are experiencing here upstate and certainly not the same as even in bubbles like Ithaca. So this is some of the work that demographers and others who are really attuned to these enforcement um, efforts are engaged in. Next slide. A lot of my research also focuses on not simply the top-down attempts to control migrants, and we've had long histories of how this has included forms of now in including digital surveillance, but also it's critical for us to tie the, our understanding of state terror um, towards immigrant communities, and we have lots of research that documented the mental health and other effects of immigration enforcement, especially in communities of color, um, but it's also important to understand what are the local efforts to push back. And here, what I'm showing you are examples of different individuals who have engaged, engaged in these social justice efforts, not unlike those that Girard's um, study is attempting to document for African-American abolition. But we know from FOIA reports and other uh, public requests for information that many of these migrants have also been targeted, many of them migrants of color. And these are folks who are not simply organizing in spaces of immigration, but also student movement. Um, like the individual on the left here who was um, arrested days after speaking out at a student-led rally in support of DACA, reproductive justice, like Alejandro Palacios, the woman who is uh, profiled here in the middle, worker rights, like the two dairy workers in Vermont on the right here. So immigrant rights activism is not just organizing on behalf of immigrants or even undocumented immigrants, but the broader institutions and communities in which they are embedded in. Next slide. And so for this reason, I think it's important when we're thinking about migrations to also think about the ways in which this is tied to broader efforts towards racial justice and how these two are linked. Many of the efforts around civil disobedience, for example, again, that Gerard had mentioned, are efforts that are underway both in inside institutions like Cornell, but also other um, spaces where immigrants are fighting for their rights. And these are tied also to efforts to combat um, long-standing discrimination against, for example, Muslim immigrants and many of the hate crimes that we've seen targeting um, uh, Muslim, but also other communities who are profiled as Muslim. Um, Black Lives Matter movement has increasingly incorporated migrants as a part of their social justice agenda. And certainly the LGBT movement and many of the trans women in particular in detention have led the efforts to um, advance the rights of migrants. And so this has to be part of our analysis um, who are the different communities embedded in these struggles? Next slide. And so what is this meant for Cornell and Ithaca and many of the other communities in which Cornell's blueprint is cemented? Here in upstate New York, as well as in downstate, we know that there are various efforts to connect some of the research we're doing here on campus, but also some of the um, community engagement and student engagement efforts. We've seen efforts at the detention center here in Western New York and Batavia tied to some of the work that is happening through, for example, our feminist and gender studies um, program. We also know that the farm worker program here in the agricultural school is one of the hallmarks of the um, responsibility really that the agricultural school and Cornell has to maintaining our public mission to um, the, both the region as well as to our students who uh, are engaged in trying to understand what is the role of migration in the in the work that they're doing, both in the business and the labor side. And we also know that there are ongoing efforts in Albany around educational equity policies, um, as well as more recently the Greenlight campaign, which was targeted at providing licenses to all individuals regardless of status. Last slide. So I want to think through what this means for Cornell as an institution and what role our university can play and what responsibility do we bear. I want to acknowledge that the university has taken enormous strides even in the short amount of time that I've been here on campus, um, including hiring important support staff, which have targeted not only our undocumented students, but also been a resource for international students as well as our overwhelmingly um, Latino and other students of color. But what is needed, I think, and we bear this responsibility both as uh, educators and alumni and other community leaders to make sure we hold each other accountable, is the way in which we can think about the rights of our migrant students through a racial justice lens that requires and demands hiring of faculty that our students will see as a resource and 
Also thinking about the holistic needs that undocumented and other students with precarious immigration status have relative to, for example, tuition costs, housing requirements, and the families in which they are embedded, which often have a whole host of challenges tied to their immigration status. I see this not only as an immigrant rights issue, but an educational pipeline issue and an educational equity issue for our students of color. And so as we think about how we can be leaders or at the very least in line with the efforts that our peer institutions in the Ivy League and beyond are doing, I encourage us to be leaders, have a vision towards a leadership approach and not just one that follows. And I'll end with the following, which is to think about the role, um, next slide please, Ascari, the role that we might be thinking through in terms of sanctuary. Sanctuary is a term that is used throughout um, the analysis of the Underground Railroad. And I want us to use it here in terms of thinking about sanctuary, not just in terms of the policies, for example, that Ithaca and Tompkins County hold, but what are the different ways in which you can tie the spirit of abolition um, in the 19th century to the forms of abolition and equity here on our campus and beyond. And to use the term that Naomi Paik, um, American Studies professor, uses, this abolitionist approach to sanctuary thinks about not just the way in which we may pass policies that actively work towards implementing them, both at the state and local level in our governments, but also in our institutions. Final slide. And so I want to end here and thank you all for being here. This is a picture that I took during one of the Black Lives Matter marches that was held and organized by students um, on our campus at the height of COVID. And what I just want to mention is that this was a really inspiring space in which I saw students making all the connections which we've laid out here. And I really think that it's our role, as I mentioned, as educators, alumni, and community leaders to catch up to their vision and keep up with their lead. Thank you. Thanks, Shannon. That was great. We have a little bit of time left. I want to pull back and talk about what's going to happen with the Migrations Initiative. We've got an awful lot of events coming up. Uh, you see them on the screen there. They include a film series, a virtual roundtable on September 22nd about migration in the media uh, with some prominent journalists who will be talking about how they cover immigration <coughs> and how immigration should be covered. We also have <coughs> a conversation at the end of October um, talking about two new books that they talk, uh, have written about people on the move and how asylum processes affect the different individuals and communities. We'll also be doing a workshop in November on indigenous movement with some prominent professors here at Cornell. And we're going to have in November a, a debate sponsored by the Anaudi Center talking about the intersection of COVID and migration. So stay tuned for all of that. Uh, you can register for all of these events at our website, migrations.cornell.edu slash learn. To end before we take some questions, we believe that Cornell has everything it needs to become a transformative leader in the field of migrations and all that that means. There are five ways that we think Cornell's collaboration about migrations will have impact. First, we think that, as Shannon pointed out, we can transform pedagogy and research on campus, provide a space for the interdisciplinary, multi-species, global and local work in this area. Second, we think that we can raise the profile of one Cornell across the globe by our research on migrations. Third, we think we can engage diverse communities by making the boundaries between campus and community more porous and dynamic. And in that regard, the Johnson Art Museum, for example, will be having an artist in residence focused on migration coming soon. Fourth, we think that our work on migrations will influence policy and multi-sectoral engagement um, with these various important questions. And fifth, we think we can, through our research, improve life for migrants and societies in which they live and which all of us live. Next slide. We have a lot of links here that you will see and they'll also be put into the chat by ways that you can keep up with what we're all doing on migrations, and we encourage you to do so. With that, we have about five minutes left, and I think that'll be enough probably for one question for each of you. Um, Wendy, let me start with you. An audience member asked, would local food production be able to support the current world population given that it may be less efficient than industrial food production. Do you agree with the premise of that question? And if so, how would you answer? 
Um, thanks, Steve. And I'm really grateful to the audience member for asking that question because it's an excellent question. It, as you can imagine, has been debated quite intensively. Um, I think we can go a little bit long in our webinar today, so I'll just take a couple of minutes because honestly it's so important and it's quite complicated. Um, I actually don't think it's quite so black and white. I don't think it's one or the other, um, but rather a question of whether we can stop unfairly privileging large-scale plantation agriculture vis-a-vis small-scale or local agriculture. So that, that's one thing. A, a matrix of different sizes and forms of agriculture I think would be the most productive and the most resilient. So just to answer the spirit of the question, um, first, I think we arguably have too much of certain kinds of food and not enough of others. The second point is related to the first, which is that we lose or waste a lot of food. So we have overproductivity, and because of our long chains, we have a lot of waste in those, in those chains. Third, smallholders are the, the number one in terms of people um, set of farmers or class of farmers in the world. And they currently produce 30 to 40 percent of the world's food on just 15 percent of the world's arable land. And that's probably an overestimate. So they're incredibly efficient with limited resources, and they operate on this uneven playing field, as I've said, with subsidies, market power, and agricultural research, a place like Cornell, where we do a ton of research that I would say is skewed towards large farms and commodity crops. You have what people refer to as an inverse ratio, which is an inverse size productivity ratio for small farms. So they could be quite you know, powerful in feeding the world's population. But finally, um, my colleague Phil McMichael has said so rightly that we shouldn't ask, are we producing enough, but rather, are people hungry and why? And if we focused more on hunger, we would care less about supply, we'd still care about it, but we wouldn't focus on it, right? We would focus on how to get people who need food their food. So do I think that if we change the conversation, that smallholder and local agriculture could play more of a role in feeding the world with very positive consequences for some of the things I mentioned? Yes. Great. Question for you, Gerard. Audience member asks, what do you hope to find when you conduct your excavations at the church? <laughs> Thank you for that question. That's the big question that we're facing in front of us. Um, let me just say that uh, we are following through on what the St. James AME Zion Church is interested in. They have already gotten documentation that uh, Harriet Tubman had been there, that Frederick Douglass had been there, and now they want to pursue um, the, the sort of oral history around the possibility of a tunnel uh, being to the side of, of the church. Um, and I think what that, ref that responds to is really... Um, First of all, we had a physicist come in, uh, Larry Brown, who did uh, ground penetrating radar and showed in the language of, of the science that there were anomalies there, right? Now, of course, until we start the excavation, we're not going to know exactly, you know, the, the, the depth and breadth of what that might mean. But I think in having St. James, the principal uh, uh, underground railroad station, ask us that question, they're trying to get at a sense of um, the hope, the experience, the hopefulness, um, the courage of the experience of being on the Underground Railroad. They're trying, I think we all are trying to find the material sort of remnants of what that would be, what that would say, what would those objects say about that courage and about that hopefulness. So I think that's what we're after. I know it's not telling you exactly what's there, but uh, we'll be the first to let you know if we find anything. Thanks for yeah. your question. Can't wait. And Shannon, last question for you. Um, audience member asks, how is the impact of historical eugenics and pseudoscience around cultural attributes shape the legal policies that have established the immigration legislation that we still are under? Uh, thanks for the question. And again, I'm not a historian, but I will draw on the work of my colleague and Carnegie fellow, Maria Cristina Garcia, who works upon, who's worked on this and um, trying to understand the way bordering policies have, have operated. Um, and also the historian May Nye, who writes about this. And I'll just say kind of two main things that point to not only 
eugenics, but also um, the ways in which you've developed norms around um, certain racialized populations. And two current policies that we think of as being very modern and kind of part of contemporary policy debates include, for example, the public charge issue. Um, the public charge issue recently, which Steve and his colleagues have written a lot about over at the law school, essentially would uh, foreclose certain uh, welfare programs for even eligible documented migrants. And this is certainly part of current contemporary debate, but stems back to the ways in which we thought about um, bordering policies and admission policies as being tied to not only generally individuals who were deemed to be productive and wouldn't become wards of the state. And this includes not only workers, but it was an essentially very ableist approach to thinking about disability, um, different ways of engaging in the community across the life course, um, institutionalized populations, et cetera. And so the word public charge is part of a long-term um, discriminatory set of policies that we had even around the beginning of the cre and the creation of what we think of today as the Border Patrol. The other is a provision of um, that's still, for example, on the naturalization application, this idea of good moral character. And good moral character can be the, understood in a number of different ways by the immigration officer. But in the early era of anti-Asian um, migration policies, for example, this is very much targeted, especially at Asian American women, ideas about sexual morality, et cetera, et cetera. And there's still language in a lot of these um, policies and forms that um, harken back to that. And so I think that in both of those um, you know, ways in which we think about immigration policy as being kind of a, a vestige of of current debates, it really has, has deeper roots that really can be tied back, I think, to not only the ways in which we think about migration from non-European countries, but also tied to the ways in which we have developed anti-Black racism, as well as anti-Indigenous um, policies around things, for example, like boarding schools, which we're seeing in the contemporary um, debate as well. So thanks very much. I'll turn it back to Steve. Great. Well, with that, we have to conclude. There's been a lot that we've learned in this hour here, and we focused on human migration in this webinar, but the Migrations Initiative focuses on migration across species, and we had some questions about interspecies migration that we did not have time to get to. I encourage all of you to sign up for more events at the Migrations Initiative at migrations.cornell.edu slash learn. And uh, thank you very much. You will receive a link to the recording after this. And we look forward to seeing you at future events. With that, we're done for today.